growth uh, globally is unsustainable. Um, we contend that we need to fundamentally change the way that we deliver the basic services of energy, water and waste because the speed of economic growth is putting a strain on that delivery mechanism. So what we do in the environmental markets is we aim to invest in companies that are delivering services and technologies um, to solve those uh, infrastructure delivery problems. Um, there, are, there are many uh, companies that are supported by policy, um, taxation, etc. Uh, but essentially what we do in this market is we look at companies in the energy, water and waste sector um, that, are, that are benefiting from trends around the delivery of energy, water and waste. So you can see that through things like concerns over energy security, increasing pollution levels, increased consumption due to uh, uh, greater affluence in the emerging markets, these are all creating a, a significant challenge we invest in companies that are rising to that challenge. Next slide. So what characterizes the opportunity? Well, first of all, it's a very large opportunity. I think a lot of people think of, of what we do uh, as simply being all about renewable energy. And that's, that's, that's a part of it, but it's a very small part of it. Um, these, are, these are large markets growing faster than the broader stock market. Um, higher growth rates very limited additional volatility, and within these environmental markets, we're able to diversify the portfolio, gain exposure to cyclical stocks as well as defensive stocks, so we can really sort of play the market in front of us, uh, depending on what's going on uh, financially at any particular time. These are also markets which are permanently evolving. What we mean by that is that we see a significant amount of M&A in these markets, so some significant value creation has come out of the fact that large companies are entering the environmental markets buying smaller businesses to gain access to those higher growth rates. Um, we also see substantial new IPO flow into the sector, so notwithstanding the fact that the market is currently very volatile, um, we've seen in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years, a substantial number of companies IPO in this market because there's, you know, there's great appetite among investors for high growth uh, businesses exposed to the long-term secular growth drivers that, that we're interested in. So it's a big, dynamic market, growing faster than the broader stock market. Um, and it's, there's no additional, or relatively little additional volatility versus a global equities benchmark. So you needn't think about the environmental markets as being very volatile. Thanks, Patrick. So how do we look, or look at or categorize the markets? Well, we've already talked about energy, water, and waste. Within those three subsectors, we actually then subdivide into 21 different technology groups. I mean, the, the sort of the obvious one that everyone thinks about when you think about environmental investing is renewable energy. Um, renewable energy equipment manufacturers currently clearly sort of under the microscope because of the falling cost of technology. These companies are struggling to to generate any meaningful profitability at the moment. The cost of polysilicon uh, is is falling. Over the last month or two, it's been falling between 5 and 10 percent a week. Um, that, you know, substantial price declines there. Uh, we think this is an area where there's going to be you know, a lot of additional M&A because there's a lot of cheap Asian competition coming in and driving down price. It's a very, very tough market currently. That's also um, pretty, much, pretty much the same situation as going on in the wind turbine market. At the moment. Falling cost of technology, overcapacity, cheap Asian competition is driving down price and profitability. A very, very challenging market to, to make any money in. The flip side of that is that the guys that are developing renewable energy projects, notwithstanding a slightly benign environmental uh, or rather um, policy backdrop, uh, are finding that their IRRs on their projects are actually substantially more attractive because they're able to get great deals on turbines. So you can see in there there are, there are a few dynamics simply within the, the energy, renewable energy part of the portfolio. Um, that make certain areas a lot more attractive than others. What's key about renewable energy is that it's a relatively special situation, so it doesn't tend to move in a particularly cyclical way. The flip side of that is that we have a very sort of uncorrelated energy efficiency um, sector that is a sort of direct offset to renewables. So at the moment, from a portfolio management perspective, we're, we're pretty much underweight, or quite significantly underweight uh, renewable energy. But we've, we've been substantially overweight energy efficiency. So these are stocks that are exposed to consumer electronics, the construction cycle, for example, uh, the auto cycle, and um, particularly the new or 
upcoming CAPEX cycle in um, energy efficient transmission and distribution equipment. We'll talk about that a little bit later. On the water side, water has been one of the best performing areas in which uh, we've been able to invest uh, for, for a very sustained period, actually. There are some very, very strong long term growth drivers that work in the water sector, not least of which is population growth from rural to urban areas in the emerging markets. So we, we've, uh, we've identified that there are about 300 million people in China who are forecast to move from rural areas to, to new urban areas uh, in the next uh, 15 to 20 years. And China has 20% of the world's population and 7% of the available water resources. So you can see that with those types of imbalance, there's a massive infrastructure requirement, driving a very, very attractive long-term uh, investment. You also have to increase the cyclicality within that exposure to water infrastructure and construction, uh, as well as businesses involved in things like filtration, where you buy a system and then have very solid consumables revenue behind that. So again, from a portfolio construction perspective, you're able to get more defensive by investing in water utilities, or you're able to gain exposure to more cyclical stocks involved in construction, for example. Um, pollution control, again, one of the sectors which has a lot of um, mandated spend from governments behind it. Again, not a big emerging market story. The Chinese government spending significant amounts of money on air and water quality and monitoring. That's again been a very sort of solid, relatively defensive part of our, of our portfolio position. Again, sort of the, the forgotten part of this whole uh, investment thing is, is the waste management side of the business. So again, you have cyclicality in, in companies exposed to recycling and commodity pricing. But you also have generally a very long-term contract-based sector where you can sign a contract for 15 to 20 years. Uh, there are very high barriers to entry. Um, there are some very specialist technologies and very specialist materials that are being treated in this sector. And again, it offers us as portfolio managers some options for taking the, the, the portfolio to a more defensive direction. Thank you. So, what does that all mean? Well, it means that the sector has outperformed for the long term. So we at Impact in London have a, a seven year uh, gifts compliant track record. And you can see that this is um, an index we put together in a joint venture with FTSE. It shows the long term outperformance uh, of the space in general. And it shows you, to some extent, the, the ability that we have to play the market conditions that are in front of us. There are a few statistics there about, about the market. It's a relatively high beta sector to be involved with. But as I mentioned, the, the earnings growth is um, at 15.5%. That's so about as low as it's been for a few years, but it's still probably 2 to 3% ahead of the broader, whether it's in the MSL market, for example. So, our performance. <laughs> and again, yeah, this is one that I'll go through very quickly, but you can see examples of some of the um, like it's physical examples of some of the things that we're trying to, to invest in that are finding solutions to some of these issues. Floods. So renewables we've spoken about uh, in brief. Um, one key point I'd like to make on renewables, we've spoken a little bit about how the falling cost of technology is, is very beneficial for those developing projects. And Bloomberg New Energy Finance this morning uh, released its levelized cost of uh, technology analysis. Um, let me just tell you what they said. They said that there's been a 12% or well, they expect a 12% fall in the next five years in the cost of wind technology. Their levelized cost excludes all subsidies. So they're expecting onshore wind to be competitive with combined cycle gas turbines um, by 2016. Now, I think probably if we continue to see the cost of technology falling at the current rate, it's going to be a little bit quicker than that. And I think that's, that exceeds people's expectations. People think of wind as it is completely reliant on subsidy. Um, and I think you know, there's, a, there's a very strong case for that 2016 date being a little bit sooner than that. And that's a very optimistic story in terms of long term investment in the sector. Um, BP. BP has put out uh, on an annual basis an energy outlook um, chart. What this actually, the short story behind this chart uh, is that depletion of global fossil fuels and the subsequent price pressure in the industry makes a very strong 